Okay, so not to fear, no dependent origination tonight. No links, just a fun talk. This talk is about the subject of dana, or generosity and giving. And there's going to be a number of little suttas that I've kind of pulled out of things. And it's kind of fun stuff. You know, I always enjoyed the, the subject of generosity when I started going through this whole process because it, you know, you start talking about the benefits of it. And it's really kind of exciting. You know, it's things that you can do to make things better. You know, we're all looking for our 401ks. Well, this is the Donna 01k or, or however you want to say it, you know, the things that you can um, benefit yourself in the future. Um, so last time I did like a half hour and this time I'm just going to do a full talk. I was talking to Delson and I said, we don't really cover, we, there's three pillars of the Dhamma, and that's morality, which is precepts and all of the rules. And there is um, dana, which is uh, generosity. And then there is bhavana, which is meditation. So you're all doing, you know, the first and third ones all of the time. But the second one is more for after the retreat. Um, yeah, you can be generous in some ways on this retreat, but for the most part, you're, you're just busy developing the mind. And the precepts are all kind of automatic. You're just following those uh, as part of your retreat. So the, f the first, you know, when you get out into the world, um, the challenge will be those first two precepts. And of course, keeping some meditation going, but making sure that you're following your rules and doing things that will help your mind, like dana. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is read from Sutta number Majjhima Nikaya 142, the Dakina Vibhanga Sutta. This is the exposition of the offerings. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country at Kapalavatu in Nigroda's park. Then Mahaprajapati Gotami took a new pair of cloths and went to the Blessed One. Now Mahaprajapati was his mother, his stepmother, because his original mother died seven days after he was born. And she arose into, what is it, two seat to heaven? I'm not sure which one it was, but his actual mother died within seven days of when he was born. And this happens to all Buddhas. All Buddhas are born in what is at that time India. And they all go through the same path. Now somebody, somebody was saying the next Buddha though, this, this Buddha went through seven years of austerities. But the next Buddha, it, I heard from somebody that he'll only have to go through seven days. <laughs> so um, he's going to have a, a lot easier. Um, after paying homage to him, she sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, this new pair of cloths has been spun by me, woven by me, especially for the Blessed One. Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One accept it from me out of compassion. So she's making a gift. When this was said, the Blessed One told her, Give it to the Sangha, Gotami. When you give it to the Sangha, both I and the Sangha will be honored. A second time and a third time, she said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, accept it from me out of compassion. A second time and a third time, the Blessed One told her, Give it to the Sangha. When you give it to the Sangha, both I and the Sangha will be honored. Then the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One accept the new pair of cloths from Mahaprajapati, Gotami. 
Mahapajapati Gotami has been very helpful to the blessed one. So Ananda thinks that it's being um, rejected. Has been so Mahapajapati Gotami has been very helpful to the blessed one, venerable sir. As his mother's sister, she was his nurse, his foster mother, the one who gave him milk. She suckled the blessed one when his own mother died. The blessed one too has been very helpful to Mahapajapati Gotami, Venerable Sir. It is owing to the Blessed One that Mahapajapati Gotami has gone for refuge to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. It is owing to the Blessed One that Mahapajapati Gotami abstains from ki killing living beings, from taking what is not given, from misconduct and sensual pleasures, from false speech and from wine, liquor, and intoxicants, which are the basis of negligence. It is owing to the Blessed One that Mahapajapati Gotami possesses unwavering confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and that she possesses the virtues loved by the Noble Ones. It is owing to the Blessed One that Mahapajapati is free from doubt about suffering, about the origin of suffering, about the cessation of suffering, and about the way leading to the cessation of suffering. The Blessed One has been very helpful to Mahapajapati Gotami. Now, I would say that little phrase there meant that maybe she had some experience of Nibbana. That is so. So the Buddha says, that is so, Ananda, that is so. When one person owing to another has gone for refuge to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, I say that it is not easy for the former to repay the latter by paying homage to him, rising up for him, according him reverential salutation and polite services, and providing robes, alms food, resting places, and medicinal requisites. When one person owing to another has come to abstain from killing living beings, from taking what is not given, from misconduct and sensual pleasures, from false speech and from wine, liquor, and intoxicants, which are the basis of negligence, I say that it is not easy for the former to repay the latter by paying homage to him. When one person owing to another has come to possess unwavering confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and to possess the virtues loved by the Noble Ones, I say that it is not easy for the former to repay the latter by paying homage to him. When one person owing to another has become free from doubt uh, about suffering, about the origin of suffering, about the cessation of suffering, and about the way leading to the cessation of suffering, I say it is not easy for the former to repay the latter by paying homage to him. There are, so he's saying, it's, it isn't easy f to repay all of the gifts that the Buddha has given her. And this whole section here, I'm not sure that is really needed. So let's get into the, this, he's, he's saying, he, he understands that she can offer the gift, of course, but he's taking this opportunity to talk about giving, about the benefits of giving and what giving is. There are 14 kinds of personal offerings, Ananda. One gives a gift to a Tathagata, accomplished and fully enlightened, a Buddha. This is the first kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to a Pacheka Buddha. This is the second kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to an Arhat disciple of the Tathagata. This is the third kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of arahatship. This is the fourth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to a non-returner. This is the fifth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of non-return. So what is entered upon the way? That's the path knowledge. So there is path knowledge and fruition knowledge for each attainment. So we're working down from a Buddha down, down the line here.
through all of the attainments. One gives a gift to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of non-return. This is the sixth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to a once-returner. This is the seventh kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of once return. This is the eighth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to a stream enterer. This is the ninth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of fruit of the fruit of stream entry. This is the tenth kind of personal offering. So these are offerings to people that have attained Nibbana from the highest down to the lowest noble noble person. Pacheka Buddha is a Buddha who has decided to not teach. He's just, he goes, there's actually a realm where a bunch of Pacheka Buddhas hang out and just, um, they're just there. They just be with each other. So, and you can have, I think as Delson said last night, a kind of like a Pacheka Arahat who says, okay, I've, I've realized everything, but it's my decision to just go into the forest and just enjoy my state of mind. <clears throat> Here in Ananda, okay, whoops. Okay, so now we go outside. One gives a gift to one outside the dispensation who is free from lust for sensual pleasures. This is the 11th kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to a virtuous ordinary person. This is the twelfth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to an immoral, ordinary person. This is the thirteenth kind of personal offering. One gives a gift to an animal. This is the fourth, fourteenth kind of personal offering. So again, we've gone from a very virtuous, moral, um, ordinary person, which you know could be a priest. It could be, you know, it could be somebody who's who believes following morality is very good and that's what they do but they they're not buddhist they may be a, another religion uh, but they live their life in a virtuous way and all all the way down to somebody who is immoral say perhaps a homeless person who's just you know doing some drugs or alcohol and and steals and and that's an immoral person down to an animal which is you know an animal however here in ananda by giving a gift to an animal the offering may be expected to be repaid a hundredfold by giving a gift to an immoral ordinary person the offering may be expected to be repaid a thousandfold by giving a gift to a virtuous, ordinary person, the offering may be expected to be repaid a hundred thousandfold. By giving a gift to one outside the dispensation who is free from lust for sensual pleasures, the offering may be expected to repay a hundred thousand times a hundred thousandfold. So just giving, what the Buddha is saying here is just giving a gift feeding something to an animal has a hundredfold return in terms of the karmic results that will come back to you. Feeding something, giving a gift to a homeless person, giving a, some, some food or some money or something to a homeless person holding his sign out there can return um, a thousandfold and then giving a gift to just somebody who lives their life as an ordinary person who's, you know, they have a job and everything, you get up into the uh, hundred thousand fold. So giving gifts is very powerful. It's not to be taken lightly. However, doing immoral things can also have opposite and uh, extreme results as well. But let's talk about the the good things here. So that's why I'm, I'm, I like to, I mean, if, if Duke comes around or the cat, I, I'm giving him something to eat. And 
I'm, I'm just preparing my heavenly mansion. <laughs> or just in case, if I come back as Duke's brother, I'll get plenty to eat my next lifetime. Who knows? We, we want to be prepared. You know, Buddhism and, and religion and all these, all these things, we don't get involved with it because so much of what it can do like today, although it can do a lot, we get involved because we're trying to plan for our future because we all have futures. We have a future in this lifetime and if you believe it, we have a future in future lifetimes. And those lifetimes, it's very important because some of those lifetimes in, in these other realms can be extremely long. And so we want to be in the right one. So we should learn what it takes to get into those. In the same way when you go to work and they say, are you planning for your future? No, I'm just getting my money and my paycheck and, you know, get my new Mercedes. And No, you should save some money. So here we have a 401k plan and you need to invest the money in something that's reasonable. Now put it in the in some stocks and bonds, and here's a good allocation. Sometimes people come in to, you know, um, seminars on what you should invest in. And what are you doing? You're taking care of yourself for the future. This is this is uh, very smart planning. So here we're taking care of ourselves for the future as well. Now your meditation practice practice is going to benefit you in this very life for sure. And also the giving in a way. But karmically, gifts take a long time to mature. Um, one place I read that it took, a gift in this made in this lifetime had almost no effect. In the next lifetime it had, it started to have a major effect. In the lifetime afterwards, it had its main fruit that would occur. So. That's why when you give gifts, you don't see results quickly. Matter of fact, you could say, well, giving doesn't lead to anything and have a doubt about whether giving is good. And of course, that's why there's ignorance and that's why because people don't know. They do things and they don't see an immediate result, so they, well, maybe this doesn't work. But there's many other gifts to giving which we're going to get into, not just financial gain or, you know, getting stuff. There's definitely more things. Matter of fact, let's talk about some of those. Uh, there's this sutta right here. Okay. Okay, from the in Gutra Nikaya 5.256. This, what it says right here is that without abandoning these five qualities, one is incapable of entering and remaining in the first jhana. Would you like to know what those are? So you can remain in the first jhana, and it says the first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, the fourth jhana incapable of realizing the fruit of stream, stream entry, the fruit of non-returning, the fruit of so on up to arahatship. So what would be those things that would prevent you from, well, number one is stinginess as to one's monastery or lodgings. In other words, stinginess, not sharing your house, your Say somebody wants to come and they don't have a place to stay. You say, oh, come, here's a place to stay. Uh, stinginess as to one's family of supporters. Now, this is one's family. For a monk, it would be supporters. You might say, if somebody needs some help, you say, oh, this supporter over here knows all about computers. <laughs> Go, go talk to him about your computer. Let me, let me, I'll put you in touch with him. So you help people to use your resources. Um, stinginess as to one's gains. 
well, your gains, uh, financial, giving away money, buying things, buying people's people meals, whatever you can to help people to live their life better. One's status, um, stinginess as to one's status. That's a little more sticky, one's status. I suppose sharing the, the, the limelight, if you will, and not preventing anybody from getting their own um, uh, recognition or uh, giving good comments to people. And stinginess as to the Dhamma. And not, so that would mean, of course, not sharing what you're learning here. When you share the Dhamma, the Dhamma is the best gift. When you share with somebody how to make their life more happy, how to be free of depression by using forgiveness meditation, and you see results, that is a huge gift. So these are, these are all gifts. But one of these is one's gains. And that's really what we're kind of talking about here in the sutta, hundredfold, thousandfold, this kind of thing. So that's, and the Dhammapada, 223, it says, conquer stinginess with a gift. When somebody, um, when your neighbor gets upset at you, when you have a problem with a relative, a problem with somebody, give them a gift. Just don't, no, don't make a big deal of it, but just give them something. When they see you coming, first thing they think is, this person's no good. And then here you are, you're giving them something. They're going, well, they're no good, but, well, okay, yeah, give me that. <laughs> and, okay, you got any more of that? You know, and then pretty soon, and maybe they... So you break down that barrier um, of anger, of hatred. So giving breaks down a lot of barriers. What are the rewards of generosity? These are the, this is from the Anguttara number uh, uh, 5.35. Lots of good stuff in the fives. <laughs> there are the five rewards of generosity. One is dear and appealing to people at large. One is admired by good people. One's good name is spread about. One does not stay f stray from rightful duties of the householder. And with the breakup of the body at death, one reappears in a good destination, in a heavenly world. So, um, one is dear and appealing to people at large. When you give and you share, word gets around, for sure. Um, when you're evil and no good, word gets around. So, when you're generous, word gets around. And so when people see you and they go, oh, this person's okay, you know, we, we know about him. One is admired by good people. So the good people know that you're doing good and they are, it, they're admiring of that. People who may be stingy themselves may think, oh, that person's just trying to make a good name and he's, he's just trying to show off and that's envy and that's jealousy. You should be celebrating that person's um, uh, good fortune. Um, one's good name is spread about. One does not stray from the rightful duties of the householder. Okay, I'm not sure about how that works. But then with the breakup of the body at death, one reappears in a heavenly destination. The way the Buddha taught the Dhamma was he would talk about morality and precepts first and following these five precepts which you've heard many times and that makes the mind quiet tranquil there's no guilt there's no remorse and then he would talk about the benefits of generosity and people would start to think about how they could get some of those benefits and their minds would become uplifted because they'd think, oh, well, I could do those things and think of all those great benefits that I would obtain. And they'd start to think, you know, and, and start to be 
kind of happy thinking about what they could become in the future if they did the right thing. And once the Buddha saw that their mind was uplifted, he would then teach them the Dhamma. Because it's like when you obtain a, you enter a jhana, your mind is uplifted. And then, you're, then you see things and everything unfolds. But just normally um, talking to somebody, he would go through this process in a talk. You can see it if you, if you find some talks like that. He would talk about the benefits of the heavenly worlds. And then he would go into the Dhamma and, and not be, his, his point was not to um, get people to heaven. Because once you get to heaven, you can come back from heaven. And there's 31 realms of existence and there's all these different places. But your karma will only last so long. So the Buddha is trying to get you off the complete wheel of existence. So he's not going to stop with heaven. He's going to say, okay, now let me teach you the Dhamma, which will get you off this wheel of existence. In um, the next one, if beings knew as I know the results of giving and sharing, they would not eat without having given. Nor would the, the stain of miserliness overcome their minds. Even if it were their last bite, their last mouthful, they would not eat without having shared. If there were someone to, if there were someone to receive their gift, but because beings do not know as I know the results of giving, and the results of, oh yeah, of giving and exertion, should be they should be made to understand this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. The stain of miserliness overcomes their minds. Okay, that's out of order. I think you get the point, though. Um, that's why if you can share every single meal, if you can buy everybody's meal, if you can give, 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 um, this, is, this is all going to come back and help you. But what else does it do? it actually makes your mind less sticky because your mind is going, that's my money and I'm not giving it away. Maybe somebody else will pay. Oh, that'd be great. And I'm definitely not going to tip them very much because I don't like that waiter, you know, whatever. I'll give them a dollar or something like that because I got to keep, I got to hang on to this money because it's mine. I made it. So when you start to let go of things like that, you, you pay for somebody else's meal, now it's, it, it opens your mind. It relaxes the mind. It makes the, when you give something, it makes you happy. There's a, there's a sense of uh, joy coming from that. And so it doesn't, you know, just one gift is not going to make a huge difference. But if you do this every day, your mind completely opens up like this, these flowers. And you're just giving, giving, nothing. You don't own anything anymore, even though it's your money. Maybe it's your 401k. But you say, well, you need some money? Let me hear. You need a new something? I'll buy it. Delson lived with the guy, Greg Halpern. And he loved, he, said, he told a story, he loved to go to the bank with this guy. Because he'd, he'd go to the bank, go to the ATM, or guy, well, not the ATM, go inside and get a bunch of cash. And he'd go out and Delson would be waiting in the car. He says, hey, here's a thousand bucks. Uh, you know, have fun. And Delson would go, thousand dollars? Know, the guy was just a master of giving. He's just giving things to everybody. So everybody loved him. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> People love to be around him. <laughs> but he also lived in an 8,000 square foot house in Rancho Verde, it was? No, what was it? Anyway, in San Diego. Very expensive place. But his nature was to just give, give, give. And so you could see the results of that, even here and now. Another uh, interesting part of giving is that you see people, say, up in power, 
um, they end up in country club jails. Now, one of the problems with getting money is abusing it. Now, somebody may have done something good in the past, in another life, or in this life, or whenever, and their business has flourished, and now they have millions of dollars. But they don't have any morality. They don't have any restraint. And so they use this money. They may, um, they may feel a lot of power. They may want more money. They may want to embezzle money from the company. They want... Um, so, okay, let me set this up a little better. So somebody has gotten into a high place of power and they have lots of money, but they want more. And so they realize that since they're the treasurer, they can go and reach in and just take some more money for themselves. So then they get caught. But this person has a lot of merit from the past. They go to, they get caught, they get convicted. They go to a country club jail. You know, they, they have everything they need. Was, Sir, what can I get you? You know, and they've got all their friends in there and and they've got plenty of food and they, they have still have a lot of money and so they're paying off everybody. and So they're having a great time in jail. Now somebody else gets caught doing this with no merit. They go and get thrown in the hole and they get nothing. And so they're... so. Th so when you see people who've done some pretty bad things, but you know you know that they, they're people of power and they have a lot of money and they have a lot of um, you know whatever, and they don't get the book thrown at them, this could be because of their merit is mitigating this damage that they're doing. It's putting it off. But don't worry, it will catch up. They will see the result of their bad actions at some point. Maybe it's not this lifetime. Maybe it's a future lifetime. Well, it will definitely be a future lifetime. But these things take a long time to mature. So let me get back to the sutta. So we just talked about the how many thousand folds these gifts um, can go to. All right, so so we were at the, by giving a gift to one outside of the dispensation who is free from lust for sensual pleasures, the offering may be expected to repay a hundred thousand times a hundred thousand fold. So a hundred thousand times a hundred thousand. By giving a gift to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of stream entry. This is attaining the first, the path knowledge. The offering may be expected to be repaid incalculably, immeasurably. What then should be said about giving a gift to a stream enterer? This is somebody who's got the fruition of stream entry. What should, said about, what should be said about giving a gift to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of once returner, to a one, to, or, or the fruit of once return, to a once returner, to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of non-return, to a non-returner, to one who has entered upon the way to the realization of the fruit of arahatship, to an arahat, to a pacheka Buddha, what should be said about giving a gift to a Tathagata accomplished and fully enlightened? There are seven kinds of offerings made to the Sangha Ananda. One gives a gift to a Sangha of both bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, headed by the Buddha. This is the first kind of offering made to the Sangha. One gives a gift to a Sangha of both bhikkhus and bhikkhunis after the Tathagata has attained final Nibbana. So this is the full Sangha, the Buddha, the bhikkhus, and the bhikkhuni. And now the second one, the Buddha is out of the picture now, but now we have still the complete Sangha. One gives a gift to a Sangha of bhikkhus. This is the third kind of offering made to a Sangha, so just the bhikkhus. One gives a gift to a Sangha of bhikkhunis. This is the fourth kind of offering made to the Sangha. 
One gives a gift saying, appoint so many bhikkhus and bhikkhunis for me from the sangha. This is the fifth kind of offering made to the sangha. So you're giving to a group of, say, monks in a room or something. Um, appoint so many bhikkhunis for me from the sangha. Appoint so many bhikkhus. This is the seventh kind of offering. In future times, Ananda, there will be members of the clan who are yellow necks, immoral persons for the sake of the Sangha. Even then, I say an offering made to the Sangha is incalculable, immeasurable. And I say that in no way is a gift to a person individually ever more fruitful, fruitful than offering made to the Sangha. So what does that mean? So when you give a gift to a monk, that monk is a representative of the entire Buddhist Sangha. So in your mind, when you give a gift to a monk, don't think you're just giving a gift to this monk. You're giving a gift to the Buddha, or to the entire Sangha with the Buddha at its head. Do this, put, do this in your mind when you're giving gifts to Sangha members like this. They're just the representative or who are here to take your gift for the entire Sangha. Because bhikkhus and, and nuns, they share. They share everything. So a, a gift to one of them just is a gift to all because they share everything. So don't make it a personal gift. Like Bhante would always say, hey, I'm accepting these gifts, but you're giving them to the Sangha. There are, Ananda, four kinds of purification of offering. What for? There is the offering that is purified by the giver, not by the receiver. There is the offering that is purified by the receiver, not by the giver. There is the offering that is purified neither by the giver nor by the receiver. There is the offering that is purified both by the giver and by the receiver. receiver. And how is the offering purified by the giver, not by the receiver? Here the giver is virtuous, of good character, and the receiver is immoral, of evil character. Thus the offering is purified by the giver, not by the receiver. How is the offering purified by the receiver, not by the giver? Here the giver is immoral, of evil character, and the receiver is virtuous, of good character. Thus the offering is purified by the receiver and not by the giver. So what we're talking about here is the power of the gift or the merit that one would accrue is purified by the person offering and also by the person receiving. So there was a story about Sariputta and the king had an executioner and this, this executioner chopped off heads at the king's whim. If, if he didn't like somebody, the king chopped the head off and the executioner took care of it. Well, this executioner, he had a lot of bad merit, let's just say. This guy, he was not going to a happy place. And what happened was Sariputta went, was on alms round one day and the executioner saw him and he had some rice. And he thought, oh, that look at that monk. That monk is so perfect and tranquil. Um, let me go give him some rice. And so he gave him what, his own meal, which was very uh, just a small bit of rice. And the result of that gift was said to push aside all of his evil karma and throw him up into the heavenly to a, a Tava teams of heaven for some millennia of time. Because why? He, his, he was not purified. He was not pure. But his receiver was very pure. So that's the, the power of who you're giving it to. If you're giving it to a dog, that's not a real moral person. And thus, a hundredfold. But if you're giving it to a very pure person, that comes back to you. But if you're the Buddha and you gave something to Sariputta, well, that's, the, that's like the most powerful gift because you have two pure people. 
But of course, their gifts, they're, they're not coming back, so it doesn't really matter in that case. And how is the offering purified by the receiver, not by the giver? Here the giver is immoral, of evil character, and the receiver is virtuous, of good character. Thus the offering is purified by the receiver, not by the giver. And how is the offering purified neither by the giver nor by the receiver? Here the giver is immoral of evil character, and the receiver is immoral of evil character. Thus the offering is purified neither by the giver nor by the receiver. So two immoral people just giving a gift, it's not going to be of, of great merit, but of course it will be of some merit. And how, <clears throat> how is the offering purified by both the giver and by the receiver? Here the giver is virtuous of good character, and the receiver is virtuous of good character. Thus the offering is purified both by the giver and by the receiver. These are the four kinds of purification of offering. So that the types of people who you're giving it to, you're, if you're giving it to the whole Sangha, that's made up of all of these pure hopefully pure beings, with the Buddha at its head. And if you're giving a gift to just the dog, well, that's not so moral, so that's... But if you're pure, then this gift that you make is actually has more merit. Not sure how that works exactly, but that's what it says here, so... Uh, yeah. So that's... Okay, so this is what the Blessed One said when the Sublime One had said that, the teacher said further. When a virtuous person to an immoral person gives with trusting heart a gift righteously obtained. In other words, you don't want to give something you've stolen. With trusting, with placing faith that the fruit of action is great, the giver's virtue purifies the offer, offering. So, Placing faith that the fruit of action is great. This means that it's okay to think that the, the fact that you're giving will result in, good, in a good karmic effect. It's okay to give something with the idea that this is beneficial to you. Now, it would be perfect if you just gave things and you didn't even think about it. But we all got to start somewhere here. You know, we're not perfect yet. So if we have a little greedy mind of, well, if I give this gift to that monk, I'll get a lot back. Hey, you know, fine. Because if you don't give it, you've accomplished absolutely nothing. And, and there's, I've read a few times where people say, well, I'm not going to give because I'm giving out of a greedy mind. And I just can't get over that. So they don't give anything. So what is karma? Karma is action. If you don't do any action, you get no result. So give the gift. If in doubt, well, I'm not sure if I'll... Just do it. Just do it. Let go. Let go. Because giving is letting go. Giving, it, letting go. Part of the six R's. Release. Relax. Re-smile. Gift makes you happy. When an immoral person to a virtuous person gives with untrusting heart, a gift is unrighteously obtained. Let's see. When an immoral person to a virtuous person gives with untrusting heart a gift unrighteously obtained, nor places f faith that the fruit of action is great, the receiver's virtue purifies that offering. So if the receiver is pure, all of the doubt of the immoral person is purified. The gift is uh, made of great benefit. When an immoral person to an immoral person gives with untrusting heart a gift unrighteously obtained, nor places faith that the fruit of action is great, they don't believe in karma, they don't believe in any of that funny stuff about life after death, neither virtue purifies the offering. So it has not very much effect. They don't have right view. And right view is, is thinking that every action that you do has benefit. If you do an action, there's going to be a result. 
And it may not be just in this lifetime, there may be results in future lifetimes. As Dalson was saying, one of the views is that your actions, whatever you do, you can go steal things, you'll have no results from that at all, other than you, you have all this money from the bank. And it's yours and nothing will happen. Well, of course, we know that you know you could be caught and thrown in jail is just one thing, not to speak of anything in future lives. But in any case, so if you have one thief giving some money to another thief, it's probably not the greatest uh, outcome. When a passionless person to a passionless person gives with trusting heart a gift righteously obtained, placing faith that the fruit of action is great, that gift, I say, is the best of worldly gifts. That's pretty. Arahat to Arahat, stream enter to stream enter. Somebody who is just following the five precepts. That's a very virtuous person. That person is very rare in the world. Almost nobody follows five precepts. They don't even know what they are. Now, many people follow morality because maybe they're religious and they, they have rules. I mean, the Ten Commandments tells you what morality is. And uh, many people follow those rules and good for them. But maybe they don't follow everything that's in these precepts, like, you know, maybe they're drinking alcohol and intoxicants. So there's, but they're not, they don't know that they're following or not following rules. They're doing the best they can. But a person who knows the precepts, like you guys do, and you know that you're following them, you are very rare in the world. And so you're of great merit to other people because you, you, you are doing something that's very unusual for the human world. So that's the end of that sutta. I have a few other little trinkets here. Let's see. So I learned about giving through the Buddhist Publication Society in Kandy. So when I was 19, um, I got very interested in Buddhism. I did a Vipassana retreat, like after the first year of college, and just thought Buddhism was really interesting. And so I wanted to read everything I could. And the only places to get anything were to send, um, send money to uh, Sri Lanka. And they had a Buddhist library there and you get these little little pamphlets and things and so they'd have all kinds of things and and i would buy all these things and you know they'd be like 50 cents for this one and a dollar for this one but i'd read all of these things and this is kind of the way that i learned about giving because i didn't know anything about it it's certainly not taught in the west it's taught to giving is good but that's about the extent of it it, it's not taught that it, it has benefits in the future. But so I learned all these things and I, and I, you know, I wasn't, I didn't feel great. You know, I, I had my ups and downs. And one time I thought, you know, because I was starting to do some retreats, but they didn't really talk about morality very much. They wanted to stay away from it because it's, you know, we don't want to be moral and, you know, somehow, uh, that was bad. It was being attached to being moral. You know, like on the retreat, on the retreat they'd say, okay, I want you to follow these precepts. But after the retreat, you know, you just, just go, go back to what you're doing. It's, this is just for the retreat. And so we would, you know, you know, back to whatever intoxicant floated your boat and anything else, lying, no, oh, it didn't matter. But on retreat, it mattered. But they only said those, those precepts once for the whole retreat. And that was the end of it. You didn't hear very much about it because they didn't want to, um, you know, knock you over the head with it. They wanted you to just, just understand it. But so I started, um, like, I don't know, something would go wrong at work. So I'd be kind of in a bad mood. And so I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just give a gift. I'll just write a check. 
and I wrote $10 checks to meditation centers. And I'd send that check out and I'd feel better for a little bit. And um, pretty soon the $10 checks got to be bigger checks. And I started do, to do better at work. And, and pretty soon I was, you know, buying people's meals. And I hung out with a lot of meditation type people uh, in California. And uh, we'd talk about this and it would just kind of feed on itself. And it's, it's, you know, the benefits of giving. So I was buying everybody's meals, and um, things were really improving quite a bit. I was getting along with people at work, you know, and wasn't really, you know, as much down as there was. So there was a real benefit to sharing because you're not thinking about yourself anymore. When you give a gift to somebody else, you're not thinking about yourself. Um, so I did that, and uh, you know, continued. And eventually I gave gifts to Damasuka and, you know, I put a bunch of money into the dining hall. Um, I bought Bonte's cabin down there. You'll see my name on it. I said, don't put my name on it. But anyway, he put my name on it. <laughs> and so I have to look at it every time. It's like, uh. And I bought this cab, this old cabin over. That was one of the first cabins. I bought that cabin. And then pretty soon um, I got invited to come to Damasuka. And I bought my own cabin, and I had, you know, at that at that point, my stock options had worked out. It was funny, I got stock options at this company, and almost nobody else that had gotten the options, it worked out for them. Somehow they, they had in their mind that they wanted to not cash them in until, you know, years in the future. I thought, no, I, I want to get out of working. So I cashed mine in, and later on, company laid off all these people <laughs> because one of the inevitable Silicon Valley slumps occurred. And I was uh, in India at that point, you know, on my journeys, because I, I was fine. I was doing really great. But these people got laid off, and they, got, and they never got benefit of their options. <laughs> And it was just so strange because we were a company that got, caught out, got bought out. And there were like 20 of us. And uh, I think I was one of the only ones. I mean, we were all, you know, doing pretty good here if we'd cashed out. And I did. But nobody else did. So it was just the strangest thing. So I have to believe that somehow the karmic effects were come, starting to come to be there. And that it was benefiting me. I don't know. Um... So now I live and I don't really need any money. Every time I need money, I, I just, it's somebody else pays the bill. I can't even pay the bill anymore. I go to lunch, I say, oh, I'll pay. No. Oh, I want to pay the bill. Then a bowl of boss is the one paying the bill. I can't ever pay the bill. She says, I want that bill. Okay, I'm giving you the bill to pay. <laughs> That's my gift. <laughs> so otherwise, I just pay the bill. But now she takes it all the time. You have to give somebody else a chance to pay the bill. I'm sure you will. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> she has more merit than anybody in this room. Believe me. Um, let's see. When I grew up, uh, my parents gave money every month to the church. They tithed all the time. Um, we went to church. We put money in the offering. I was never really taught about it. But that's something that we did. And I grew up in a, you know, pretty good, well-to, well, not well-to-do, moderately, middle class. Things were fine. We never had a problem with money. Um, but my, my parents did the right thing. You know, they gave to the church. They, they helped people out. They were down at charities and Thanksgiving. Uh, they were out uh, with the church, you know, handing out free turkeys. And I got involved with all those things when I went home for Thanksgiving. Oh, you're going to be delivering turkeys this year. Oh, okay, yeah, that's different. Uh, turkeys, all right, let's let's do that. And I ha I got to deliver some turkeys to some very, very poor people that were out there who really needed food. And some of it was, you go into some of these houses, there it's shocking the, w the way that people live. I mean, one place was, I mean, I wanted to report them to the police. I mean, they had three kids running around in diapers and 
there was stuff, junk, just piled up everywhere. It's like one of these Dr. Phil shows, you know, with hoarders. And it was, it was a bad situation. And they said, I told the church, and they said, just let that go. I said, okay, okay. So what did the Buddha say about how to spend your money? Um, there is a sutta where he talks about how to, the, the, the money that you get from your job, and, the, and it has to be getting the money in an uh, honest, decent way, with the, the sweat of the brow, the strain, the work that you, you make to get the money honestly. You divvy that money up 50% for living expenses. So half, you can just create a budget. You say, okay, I'm going to spend 50% for living expenses. You, you take another 25% and you save it. Save it for a rainy day or a tropical storm in India. And then 25% is for giving and for enjoyment of your life. So these are the Buddha's instructions. And I never followed any of that. What I did is, you know, I ate $1 McCheeseburgers and tried to save money. So I was more saving money all the time. And I never spent it to enjoy. I was more stingy to myself. And, but I was very much hoarding money to save it. And... I'd get the cheapest, thing, you know, my dinners and things. That'd be whatever the cheapest thing was. And so I started thinking about this, and I said, wow, I really treat myself poorly. And I'm treating other people really well, but I treat myself lousy. So I just started to spend some more money on myself, because it says, spend money on yourself. It's okay. It's okay. Because you're just as valuable as anybody else. Why not? And 50% for living expenses. Try, you don't need to live in your car. You can get a nice house, a nice whatever. I mean, if you're, of course, if you're making enough money, spend that money um, and don't put you know, 80% to saving or uh, in some people's case, 80% to spending and no saving and not spending any money on your house. So it's just about balancing how you, you're, you live your life with, with what money that you have coming in. And give every month. Give something every month to, to some, somebody, you know, a, 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 a charitable organization of some sort, the Sangha. This, this will, it works on your mind. You know, I'm, I'm the, you know, quote, treasurer of Dhammasukha. And when I see somebody coming on retreat, I know what their financial situation is and what the, you know, there are people that give money every month. And I'll, I'll, I, I, I told Delson one time, I said, that person's gonna have an experience. I said, why do you, they give every month. It's gonna happen. I said, okay. They did, because their mind is letting go all the time. They don't necessarily think about it, but it's operating in their mind, that, that letting go. Because so, every, you know, whatever you get, a piece of it is let go every month. And it's not all yours. So you, you're, you're constantly, it's like the government's taking taxes, but it's actually you giving it away. Um, the last thing on this page here, though, is about the genius of the Buddha. Um, you heard about the merit of giving gifts to the Sangha. Well, the Buddha set up um, the monks and nuns would live based on the support of lay people in the villages. If they did not, people, the monks, would probably just go off into the forest and they'd go and meditate and they'd just never have anything to do with the villagers. So the Buddha said no. You cannot have food, you cannot make food. You must go for alms round and collect food from the villagers. Why is this? Because then the monks come and the villagers get the opportunity 
to hear the teachings of the Dhamma every time the monk comes. Because many times a monk would go to a house, take food in that house, and after the meal give a Dhamma talk to the person who gave the gift. But the Buddha was also very sneaky because when the monks went out for alms round, uh, the lay people are giving gifts to the entire Sangha. If they know how to do it, they're giving gifts to the Sangha. And these gifts are highly meritorious and, and uh, benefit them tremendously. So the Buddha was giving the lay people a big gift and he was taking care of all of the requisites for the monks. So this, this dependency really works out well. And it just struck me the other night that these lay people, well, well they're just giving food and it's very nice, but many of them don't understand how powerful that, that, that is for them. And of course, we don't know any of this. You know, I'm not psychic. I don't know if any of this will make out work out in, in terms of, but I do know that giving helps the mind and it, re, and it relaxes the mind and it, and it makes your meditation better because you've released um, this stinginess, this, this uh, you, you let things go. Okay, I'll just finish with one or two here. Yeah, one note is, you know, what's the happiest time of the year? Christmas. What are we doing? Giving. Don't, doesn't everybody want to have Christmas like every day? Just so long as we, <laughs> our budgets might be a little limited there, but Christmas, day of giving. Okay, this is, uh, I'm not sure where this is from, but this was said by the Blessed One, said by the Arhat, so I have heard. Monks, don't be afraid of acts of merit. This is a synonym for what, synonym for what is blissful, desirable, pleasing, enduring, charming. That is, acts of merit. I directly know that. Having long performed meritorious deeds, and this is the Buddha as a bodhisattva for four mahakapas and 100,000 lifetimes. That's how many lifetimes the Buddha went around the, the, the round of existence to become a Buddha, to work on himself. I have long experienced desirable, pleasing, endearing, charming results, having developed a mind of goodwill for seven years, then for seven eons of contraction and expansion, I didn't return to this world. Whenever the eon was contracting, I entered the realm of radiance. Whatever the eon, whenever the eon was expanding, I reappeared in an empty Brahma abode. There I was Brahma, the great Brahma, the unconquered conqueror, total seer, wielder of power. Then for 36 times, I was Saka, ruler of the gods. For many hundreds of times, I was a king, a wheel-turning emperor, a righteous king of Dhamma, conqueror of the four corners of the earth, maintaining stable control over the countryside, endowed with the seven treasures. To say nothing of the times I was a local king, the thought occurred to me of what action of mine is this the fruit, of what action the result that I now have such great power and might. Then the thought occurred to me, this is the fruit of my three types of action, the result of three types of action, that I now have such great power and might. Generosity, self-control, and restraint. And the verse is, training acts of merit that yield the foremost profit of bliss. Develop generosity a life in tune, a mind of goodwill. Developing these three things that bring about bliss, the wise reappear in a world of bliss unalloyed.
here endeth the talk on giving. So give and then give again. And then give more after that. Of course. No, no. It can anybody. Anybody. Give a little piece of food to the cat. It's giving. Yeah. Um, I mean, I like this talk. It's nice. <laughs> it's fun. It's yeah. uplifting. Yeah. But it, you can also give your time. Mm -hmm. You can give meta. Yeah. Which, you know, it's hard to feel sometimes. <laughs> but you can also um, just like give someone a smile or a compliment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think our, like our Western culture is set up so that like it feels that the only way to give is through money. And I mean, it does help. But giving your time is also helpful. And um, yeah. But then I also think that like you can give too much, and I've seen that. Uh, so like the line of work that I do, I see a lot of people who give way too much with like their energy and their time. Mm -hmm. um, I used to work as an outreach worker for homeless people for mm -hmm. the homeless population, and like seeing all the seeing like how much they suffer, I felt like I needed to like mend every wound. Yeah, sure. And it was impossible because there's so many people who are like who don't have like their basic needs. And so I had to like remove myself from the situation and just say that I can only give so much and I'm not here to like fix the world's problems. Um, especially like as a woman, I feel like we're taught to like always be like very nurturing mm -hmm. and always give of ourselves. And so it was important for me, like you said, to take care of myself. Well, I think that's, that's where you want to be giving of compassion. And what does compassion mean? It means you know that there's suffering and you'll do anything you can to help, but not to hurt yourself. You can't help everybody, but you can understand, have the empathy of, you understand their suffering. And instead of just blowing it off like you're some, you know, uh, robot nurse or something like this, and just, you know, you understand these people are suffering, but you don't, be in, you don't get involved with it. That's true. You don't give them alcohol. <laughs> well, depends. <laughs> if they're going to have, like, tremors, and they could possibly die. Well, okay. Yeah, right. As a medicine for just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I can see that. Um, and then also, like, I think it's cute that you, you all give the animals food, but... I know, I know. I know. Oh, you're giving them bad habits and they're making... Yeah, well, when they're really bad, they just go... We just take food outside and leave them out there. But I I understand. I, I had a dog. They said, don't feed that dog at the table. I like feeding the dog. Well, don't do it. Because then he'll come back. So what? I like the dog, you know? It's okay. Oh, that dog's dirty. Yeah, yeah. People just don't. They don't like, you know. They say, oh, that's an animal. I don't. No, it's it's my friend, you know. So I'm treating my friends just like I do anybody else. So. All right. <sighs> Let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.